Okay, I'll, I'll try that again. Good afternoon, everybody, and, and, and welcome uh, to this event today, which is uh, Understanding Business Grants and Loans. Um, and it's delivered in partnership with the African Business Chamber. So hopefully we're, we're all on the on the right webinar. Um, it has happened in the past where somebody's managed to get onto a different particular one, but hopefully all here and, and looking forward to the, today's uh, event. So um, just a couple of things uh, before we do start and uh, appreciate that we've got quite a number of, of uh, delegates booked to attend today. So people will be joining us throughout. So the platform, uh, as you're aware, is Zoom. Uh, Zoom is, uh, has the ability for us to be able to, to raise hands and to share comments. And what we've, uh, again, decided because of the uh, amount of, of delegates that we've got is that we've, we've put everybody's microphones on to mute as standard, apart from those that obviously will be talking. And we're going to be able to take questions throughout this event today. I'm sure it's going to raise lots of different questions. So what we would ask is that you use the chat facility on Zoom to just pose those questions. And, and what I will do as part of, of my role will be to make a note of those questions. And we have got uh, an allocation of 15 minutes towards the end of, of today where we can go through those questions. And if we don't get through them all, don't worry, we will address them and we'll make sure that, that we feed those back to you. So um, we've got quite a lot to get through today. So um, what I would like to do is, is make a start really by, by just explaining a little bit about the agenda and what we're looking to cover. Um, so just in terms of welcome introductions, so um, my name's John Egley, so I'm the uh, Growth of Manager for the Greater Birmingham and Solihull area, and I'll be explaining in a short while a little bit more about what that actually is, what a growth of it is, and more importantly, how it can support you in terms of, of your business uh, ideas or your business growth ambitions. And then we're going to follow up that on by... Uh, an overview really about business finance, and that's going to be delivered by Adrian Innes from Finpoint. Uh, and then that will be followed by uh, grant funding uh, but with Dr. Richard Fallon from Technology Supply Chain. And as I mentioned at the end, we'll have a Q&A session. Uh, and the real purpose of today really was to take away some of that, um, that fear, that uncertainty, that doubt around business finance because it can be quite a challenging area to understand and that's the reason why we put this together really uh, and the approach that we've taken with this has been uh, has been really to try to simplify this as much as we possibly can but at the end of it uh, what we wanted to do is provide some options for you for further support so two aims really get across some key information about the world of business finance but also then with a mechanism to get that follow-on support should you need it. So that's that's the format uh, for today, really. Uh, and as I mentioned, it's been great to work in partnership with the African uh, Business Chamber. So without further ado, I'm just going to run through a, a few slides and I promise to keep these fairly short, but I think it's just important to understand who the growth hub is and how it can help your business so this, this presentation today has been delivered by the Greater Birmingham and Solihull Local Enterprise Partnership Growth Hub. Quite a, quite a long um, introduction there, but a growth hub is essentially the central point within a given geographical area for business support. There are actually 38 growth hubs across England, and this one just happens to be based within the Birmingham and Solihull area. Uh, it's free and then it's impartial advice. And that's something I'd like to stress that this, uh, the support that we provide is fully funded through a combination of central government funding, but also some European funding as well. So that's why we exist. We're there to be that impartial and independent resource for business advice. We are made up of a number of different teams within the Growth Hub. So we have a team of business advisors, highly experienced in terms of supporting businesses in a number of different ways. Um, and it mentions on there 
everything that an inquiry that comes in will be met by our uh, our first line team that will speak with you about what you're looking to do and that will be uh, dependent upon where that support is best provided it could be through ourselves or one of our delivery partners but to do that we would undertake a business review or a diagnostic uh, we also have a team of account management specialists really and these are for the most part sectorial based so we cover everything from food and drink to life sciences to uh, innovation we've got the uh, low carbon agenda sustainability uh, creative industries and these are advisors that have that background specialist information as well and we're also very much supported by our colleagues in the skills and apprenticeship hub and I'll talk a little bit more about that as well but a growth hub is uh, is is delivered in partnership with a whole raft of different support organizations and they can be local regional national but our part, our remit really is to understand what you are looking to try to do and provide the most effective support around all that. So this, this screenshot really is uh, a small reflection, shall we say, of the businesses that we are, organisations that we can work with to support you really. Um, in terms of what we actually deliver, it, it's, it's huge really, because we, we do cover everything from the startup agenda right through to things like international and multinational organizations we look at things like inward investment the covid eu transition grant funding strategic development leadership and management and i won't go through them all but as uh, as i'm sure you can uh, you can appreciate the world of business support can be quite uh, diverse dependent upon size sector uh, structure of those businesses and indeed what you're looking to try to achieve. So um, one stop shop and it, we are, there is no closed door policy on this. Come to us and if we can't help you, we will point you in the right direction of somebody that can. Um, I mentioned the skills and apprenticeship hub. Obviously people are one of the most critical factors to the success of any business. And that uh, can lead to things like we want to recruit somebody for a particular role. We want to develop somebody within the organization already. So the, the skills hub side of things, it very much starts with things like a training needs analysis or uh, again, a conversation with you about what you're trying to do. And this could be quite often uh, around people. So again, uh, if there's anything that, you, that you're looking to do within that, um, you can see on there that there's mention of the Kickstarter scheme, apprenticeships, anything to do with people at all, then please do get in touch. Uh, now today is very much around funding and finance and uh, suffice to say that we do have uh, some fantastic resource in terms of specialist finance advisors within the team but also the next presentation that we're going to go through really is from one, indeed one of our deliverer partners that specializes on that independent and impartial way of helping businesses raise finance for whatever they need to do within their organization. So that's a, a very quick whistle stop tour of us and what we can do. Um, and now I can, I can say that we're the best thing since sliced bread, but uh, you might not believe that, but uh, this slide just, just gives, a, a, I suppose, a, a snapshot again of some of the comments that we get from the businesses that we work with. Uh, we often find that we're, we're, we're a little bit a best kept secret and when, once people do understand about the growth hubs and the support they can get, then it tends to be a very long term relationship that we have because we're there not just to to support somebody's initial inquiry, we're there to support that business throughout its growth. So, you know, what we would always recommend is, is that if you're not already working with a growth hub, then, then uh, something that you should really consider. Um, a little bit of a plug really for uh, the event. So this is one uh, of a series of events that we actually deliver. Um, something that's very topical, as you know, at the moment, uh, the whole, EU transition agenda. We're not out of the woods yet by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, there are some developments that, that are still happening around this whole transition area. 
And uh, this particular event, which is coming up on the 1st of October, is about, again about an understanding about where we are and any other preparation that businesses need to do for that continual change that we're seeing around trade, particularly with Europe. And then on 13th of October, uh, champagne marketing on a lemonade budget. This is uh, aimed at businesses, again, that are looking to increase their, their presence, whether that's online or offline, to help uh, people understand that what they can do to support um, that, that, that individual's needs, shall we say. So that's, that's another event that, uh, that we're delivering on the 13th of October. But there's a link there through to uh, the whole of our events programme. Uh, we are going to share the slides from today, so you will get a copy of all of these. So um, at your leisure, just have a look through that. And if there's anything that takes your fancy, then we encourage you to book onto those. OK, so thank you for bearing with me on that one. I hope you find uh, that short presentation useful. The next thing I would like to do then is introduce the first of our speakers, uh, Adrian Innes. Yeah, John, thanks very much for that uh, warm introduction. Um, my, my role this afternoon is really to talk about a business finance finder. Um, you know, John, you did mention about the independent and the impartial way that we help businesses and the businesses we supported over the years. So I'm going to take the next sort of 10 or 15 minutes really to talk through what we can do to help businesses find funding in, in what is probably, you know, an, an incredibly difficult time at the moment, given the last sort of 18, 19 months of COVID. Uh, and what, what do funders look like? You know, what are they asking for in relation to being able to address a funding requirement and assess the fund, fundable business opportunity from that side. And the, the two key things predominantly is debt serviceability. So the ability to actually be able to convince a funder you can either afford it just now or what you're going to invest in, you will be able to afford to repay the debt. Secondly, which is more of a comfort factor is security. You know, depending on the amount of money you're looking to borrow, some funders will look for personal guarantees and they may look for heritable security by way of a, a charge over property. So to introduce myself, Adrian Ennis from Finpoint, 35 years funding experience, 20 years with the Clydesdale Bank and 15 years with uh, you know, the Royal Bank of Scotland, working with SMEs, so small medium enterprises right up to multinationals, PLCs and you know, funding a, a range of things through, you know, equity finance to asset finance. And as we go through the slides, we'll be able to touch on that. I'm keen that when we get into the Q&A that, uh, you know, we have as many questions as possible, because I think that's where the real answers come out from. And how we get into the you know, minutiae of actually being able to fund. So if we can move on to the next slide, please, John. So I think one of the most things I've learned over the years is, is, when people are asking for funding, do they truly understand the reason that they need that funding? So do they understand the cash flow cycle of the business? Have they done a business plan? Have they done a cash flow projection? Do they know what their break-even point is? Because a lot of businesses I speak to don't understand their break-even point. You know, their accounts will have been prepared by an accountant or a business advisor, and that they don't really understand the detail that's within that financial planning. And therefore, how can they articulate that to a business? Within, within FinPoint, you know, I run a team of uh, finance specialists with, uh, you know, many years experience. And some of the most business options, funding requirements, funding to pay suppliers, marketing, promotional activity, trade finance, you know, we, we you know, I have a saying, as long as it's legal and legitimate, you know, from the 136 funders we have on panel, we will have a funder that will consider investing and funding what you're looking for. But it's truly understanding that cash flow cycle, you know, the seasonality of a business and how you need the money and why you need the money and, and what's the return on that investment. Because if you are borrowing money, it's going to cost you, you know, interest rate and indeed fees. So what's the return on that investment? And what's what's a payback coming from that side of it? So truly understanding why a business doesn't have cash. And it comes down to the cash flow cycle. And a lot of businesses don't quite understand their cash flow cycle. 
And what I mean by that is when you first buy that raw material, if it's in manufacturing and you're building a bit of kit and selling it on, you know, how many days is it going to take you from one, you know, to buy that steel, to paint it blue, yellow or green, to sell it and then, you know, get the return on that investment, which could be 30, 60, 90 or indeed 120 days on that side of it. So looking at the understanding, the true purpose of why you need the money is one of the things we do. You know, we, we try and get into the, the nuts and bolts of, you know, understanding your business, understanding that cash flow cycle and making sure that we provide the right solution because there's many solutions out there to actually fund them, you know, be it invoice finance, asset finance and you know, uh, trade finance, import export sort of thing. So truly understanding, you know, the key reason for borrowing. We're, we're almost post-COVID, I suppose, or we're hoping that we're post-COVID, you know, and uh, a lot of business is, will have gone through very difficult times over the last 18, 19 months, you know, in relation to, they may have been closed for a number of periods because of uh, government restrictions and having to close out business. So how are you covering now? How have you actually, you know, what have you put in place to help? sustain your business going forward and what i've seen over the last uh, 18 19 months is a lot of innovation you know how you move away from the you know the retail mentality of somebody walking into a shop but actually selling your goods online so you can still generate a revenue and still sell and make, still generate sales without somebody walking through the you know the high street or the, the front door of your, your shop there can we move on to the next slide please so what options? So I've touched on as long as it's legal and legitimate, we'll have funders who will be willing to, to fund it. So asset finance, business loans, invoice finance, growth funding, pension finance, property funding, trade finance, and foreign export. So it's actually understanding the true purpose of why you need the money. So asset finance, for example, is probably to buy equipment, machinery, vehicles. Business loans can be over three years, five years, 10 years. Invoice finances against you, your debtor book. So are your debt is taking longer to pay because of their financial circumstances and where they would have been maybe three, six, nine months ago. Uh, growth capital, investment, pension finance. So, you know, if you're looking to use a bit of a pension, what to invest in property for your company. Uh, property funding, you know, are you changing from renting to owner occupied, are we going up co prop co, which is owner occupied but a separate legal entity, or do you trade internationally? And uh, you know, there's timelines for one effectively delivering the goods and shipping the goods and getting the payback from there. Recovery loan scheme. So, recovery loan scheme was introduced in April. It replaced Sybils and Bibbles, which most of you will know about. Sybils and Bibbles was 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 absolutely fantastic from a you know a, a funder point of view and from a business point of view, the government reacted very quickly and most of the high street banks and other funders reacted very quickly. You know, uh, there was the best part of 76 or 79 billion pounds funded through Sybils, about 1.9 million of funders either through Sybil or Bibbles. The recovery loan scheme, we're going to come on to the next slide, which, which looks at that in a wee bit more detail. It was obviously launched on the 6th of April and will you know, expire on the 31st of December, subject to, to review. Other things we can help with is uh, R&D tax credits. So, you know, if you have been investing in innovation and you've been investing in your business over the last couple of years to change your modus operandi in how you deliver your product or services, then there's the opportunity to claim back some of that tax. And then we look at uh, equity or venture capital. When's the right time to either borrow money from a funder or seek out equity and sell some of the shares or venture capital investments coming into your, your business there. It's about making sure that you're speaking to ourselves completely independent about how we actually structure the finance solution that will meet your needs that you need going forward. Now, it could be a combination of all of the above, uh, but it's again, it's truly understanding the purpose of why you want to borrow that money which will then drive us down the route of what would be the best possible solution to allow you to deliver on what you're looking for. Next slide, please, Tom. So as I touched on, uh, you know, Sybils and Bibbles uh, supported 1.7 billion businesses throughout the UK, just under 79 billion of funds, and it was replaced by the recovery loan scheme. Now, the, the biggest difference 
from the recovery loan scheme is, is the bullet point at the bottom there. But the BBB, British Business Bank, has stipulated that if a lender can offer you a, a choice of a commercial loan on better terms without requiring the guarantee, they should do so. So most funders we work with that are accredited, and there's about 49 accredited funders across uh, you know, the, the funding world there that are accredited under the recovery loan scheme. So if they look at your application and they can offer you a, a loan commercially on better terms of what they could do from relying on to that government uh, personal guarantee grant available, then they should do so from that side of it. It replaced, for, for some of the older people in the population, it replaced more from them guarantee the EFG, Enterprise Finance Guarantee, and it's not similar to that. So qualifying criteria, trading in the UK, would be viable were it not for the pandemic. So again, under Bibble and Sybils, you know, funders were looking at the ability to repay, i.e. debt serviceability. But what we're now looking at is, you know, what has been the impact of the pandemic, uh, COVID on the business, and is that business going to recover? Has been adversely impacted by the pandemic. There's not many businesses out there that are going to be able to say they haven't been impacted. So the majority of them will certainly have been impacted. Look at hospitality and leisure, for example. And it's not included insolvency, so probably not uh, going bust. Term loan uh, from 25,001 to 10 million, invoice finance 1,000 to 10 million, and no personal guarantees will be taken up to 250,000 pounds. If the loan is greater than 250,000 pounds, then the funder will have the option to obviously look at a personal guarantee. The, the scheme so far has, has not been as successful as Sybils or Bibbles because of the qualifying criteria. So when we look at the bounce back loan, the bounce back loan was, you know, an online application with eight questions self-certified to qualify for the £50,000. It was an interest rate at 2.5% above the bank of England base rate, and there was no repayments in the first sort of 12 months. Whereas the recovery loan scheme, the interest rate is commercial rates, so you can earn anything between 5% and 15%, and your repayments kick off immediately. There's no interest only term on it. There's no uh, you know, delay payment terms, i.e. 12 months or 18 months you could have had. And bounce back also into a 10-year term as well, where you know, this is a, a five-year to six-year term that uh, you're looking back on the bounce back with. Next uh, slide, please. So, uh, the, the key benefits of the, the business finder, I suppose, is by completing one simple application, we can reach out through the proprietary technology that we have to multiple funders. The average application that comes into us will have five or six funders matching the criteria. And when I say matching the criteria, it's how much do you want to borrow, what's the term do you want to borrow that money over, and what's the purpose do you want to borrow that money over. All funders are going to look for the ability to repay and potentially look at an element of security, be it personal guarantees and or heritable security that they may look for. But it's, uh, you know, we can reach out to five or six funders and we can discuss the options and the comparable options. So we're hoping to find five or six funders that will be able to offer you a facility and then we compare them. We're not allowed to give you advice, but what we are able to do is you know, give you the information to allow you to make an informed decision. You know, you can choose which funder to go with. You can negotiate with the funder yourself or you can use ourselves to negotiate with the funder on your behalf to complete the information. What happens is once you've completed that application, we will look at your financial accounts, we will look at your bank statements, we will do some due diligence on your behalf and we'll make sure that the project description that we're posting to our funders, which is anonymous, so initially, the funder only gets to see the amount of money you want to borrow, the purpose you want to borrow the money, the reason why you want to borrow the money, similar to purpose to a certain degree, and the term that you want to borrow that money over. Now, it's completely anonymous. There are no credit searches done or credit checks at all until we engage with a funder. That funder will then make a decision once they've had a look at that basic information and make a decision where they want to connect with you. If you connect with them, they will then be afforded the full suite of financial information that you have provided us to allow them to start to do their own due diligence on the application. It's only at that point that they will start to do any sort of soft checks to 
the formality soft checks and then full checks at the end uh, to make sure that uh, you know there's no adverse information in the background there or skeletons in the cupboard. But it means you can reach multiple funders with a simple application. So if you compare that to you know doing your own searches on the web, speaking to multiple funders on your behalf, and then having to find out financial information to five or six different funders, you know it can be cumbersome. Whereas we take that all away from you know from that side of it. Fees, I suppose. How how do we get paid? So uh, because we work very closely with BBB and the F FSB, British Business Bank and the Federation of Small Business, you will not be financially disadvantaged in any way by using our services. What happens is the funder will pay as a proportion of the fee that they charge. So, for example, if you were going to Lloyds Bank and Lloyds Bank were charging you a 1% arrangement fee, if you came to us and we placed that deal and funded that deal through Lloyds Bank, Lloyds Bank will charge you a 1% arrangement fee. They will pay as a proportion of that fee because that's their cost to originate, the cost of the opportunity that they, they can actually deliver by using you know, the platform that we have with the numbers that come through. We, we, we work very hard, obviously, to lower the cost of the business funding. So we're looking at your comparables. We're looking at the terms. We're looking at the APR. We're looking at the conditions of the lending and, and allowing you with the help and support from us to make an informed choice and decision on what's the best solution for yourselves. So touched on commercial mortgages, business loans, asset finance, working capital. We also have uh, pension finance. We also have companies that look at uh, R&D, research and development, as I've touched on, for innovation in the loans there. The internet's always open, so 24-7, although I need to work in 24-7, but you could complete an application online you know, at 10 o'clock at night or seven o'clock in the morning, if it suits you, we then pick that application up. We then speak to every customer that comes to us and we try and fully understand the reason that they need to borrow the money. We understand that cash flow cycle. We talk to them about their business plan. We talk to them about their cash flow forecast. We look at the seasonality of the business. So when are the peaks and troughs, you know, within your income, your revenue and your expenditure to allow us to actually make sure that the, the, the correct funding solution is there for you. For example, a term loan over five years to buy stocks, probably not the most appropriate thing. But revolving credit facility is more appropriate for stock because you're going to sell that stock and you're going to generate the revenue from the stock and you're going to make the profit from the stock there. Whereas a term loan over five years to buy stock that may be turned over in 30, 60, 90 days is probably not the most suitable solution for yourself. We are the only business platform in the UK with, with multiple options, you know, from the high street banks to the alternative funders, from peer-to-peer you know, -peer funders. You know, I could, I could list, I wouldn't name all 136 of them, but, you know, we do have 136 funders on platform ranging across all aspects of business loans, commercial asset, working capital, and goods finance, property pension, as I've already sort of touched on there. Uh, I think I've probably spoken there for about 15 minutes without pausing for breath. So I'll probably go to the last slide, which I think we're going to probably skip through, John, because we're going to go to Q&A at the end of the presentation. But uh, obviously, thank everyone for their attention and delighted to take questions as and when available. very much for that adrian and uh i've had a, a number of questions sent to me already but i was i will hold those towards the end uh, so it's good to see those but again please do use the uh webinar chat facility for any questions that you have uh, for either of richard or, or for adrian uh, and we'll get to those towards the end of that so so, so thank you uh, for that adrian so uh, I'll stop sharing my screen now, and what I'm going to do is, is hand over to uh, Dr. Richard Fallon, who is going to talk to us about all things grants. Brilliant. Thank you very, very much uh, for, for that introduction, Adrian. I'm just going to see if I can, if everything works okay with sharing my screen. Uh, can everybody, can everybody see that? Perfect. Thank you very much, Adrian. Thank you. And thank you for having me today. Um, it is fantastic to be here. Uh, welcome, everybody. I am very loud and lively. People seem to prefer me doing webinars because you can control the volume at your end. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about little known grants, funding, and free support, which seems to get quite a lot of interest from people. Seems to be quite popular. So are you in the right place to start with? Well, you are if you want to 
decrease costs, if you want to increase your productivity, if you want to create new products or services, or if you want to develop new processes. If you want to do any of those things, you're definitely in the right place. If you're not, you might want to check your email or do something else for the next half an hour. That, that might, it might not be your thing. So did you know there are literally tens of millions of pounds available for West Midlands manufacturing, engineering, technology, and services companies? There is a lot of money out there available, whether that's in grants or fully funded support, there is so much help out there available, you wouldn't believe it. What I found though, is it's really, really well hidden. Most people have not come across it. And I'm gonna tell you a bit about me and my background to find out how I found out all of this and why I'm here sharing this with you today. So hello, I am Dr. Richard Fallon, the CEO of the Technology Supply Chain. And we are a no cost membership which connects manufacturing engineering tech and services companies with the grants and fully funded support available. And how I got into all of this was, um, although I've been doing marketing for about the past 10, 11 years now, um, my PhD is originally from Aston in laser physics. Um, I had a really great time at Aston University, but I literally worked in an underground lab on my own. Started to think socks and sandals sounds like a comfortable combination. Maybe I need to get out just a little bit more often, a little bit more than I was. Um, and, and I, because I really like sunshine, and I really like people. You might have gathered from even the way we started this. I'm a people person. I like seeing people. So I, I went to work for British Airways, had a great time. Then I had uh, moved back up to Birmingham and did some stuff at Empower. And then basically I set my own business and I got into marketing. And then a couple of years ago, my PhD group had a reunion. And they said to me, they said, um, we've got these two brilliant projects. Uh, one of them is the Big Data Corridor and the other one was called the IPSS. So we've got these two great projects that can really help uh, small and medium-sized companies in, 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 in the greater Birmingham, Solil, Lep area. And one will help people in the Black Country, Lep area. I said, but we, 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 we find it difficult to get people engaged and getting people. He said, it's great, we can get people to a three-hour talk, but then we need to do more support with them than that. I said, so how do we do that? And um, so basically, I kind of said, uh, they said, can you help? And I said, sure. And we started promoting what they were doing. And we kind of found there's lots of companies out there who were interested in this. Because one of the things I'm kind of quite good at um, is actually taking something complex and explaining it in a kind of fairly straightforward way. So, so that's what I did. And that worked really well. And then we found out there's loads of these projects out there. I think Aston alone have got 17 of these projects. And the one thing we found that brought them all together was nobody really knew that what, what was available. They, they might find one of them, but then they probably wouldn't find the others either. And that was really how the technology could kind of supply chain, that was how we came about. And that was what drove, drove me to do this, was to actually say, look, there's bags of this help out there. We need to kind of help people to find it. So if you're going to listen to a talk today, if you follow this advice, um, you will increase your profits, you will have more free time, and you will have more fun at work. Because a lot of what we do uh, with innovation is just doing something new in the business. And something often that's automating something that's a bit boring and repetitive, or it can be using some new technology or doing digitization, there's lots of things. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it's helping you to cut costs, raise your profit, take more time off and have more fun because you can do the stuff you like at work as opposed to the boring stuff that you don't really want to do that doesn't really add any value. If you don't change anything after today's talk, I don't know, I'm not guaranteeing you're going to be like blockbusters, but it's a good example of a very successful business that just didn't change. And they changed nothing and, and, and they thought the world were kind of going on, hiring DVDs and um, all of that type of thing. And uh, that didn't work out. They did have an option to buy Netflix back in 2004 and said, no, no, we're fine hiring stuff. So it's one of those things. It's always good to look at how can I move forward? What's the next step? What should I be doing next? So why am I sharing this? Well, I'm very passionate about helping small businesses. Having run my own small business in 2004, I know the, the challenges and opportunities if you know there's some support out there and how you can access it and make life easier for yourself and get somewhere faster and the thing i'm going to mention numerous times in this talk is i'm trying to avoid what i call half-built bridges and that's where you've got a fantastic idea you get going on it you find a bit of support but then you run out of support and you run out of money before you can actually you know reach fruition before your bridge is built because otherwise a half-built bridge doesn't give any value to anybody, it kind of goes nowhere. And um, so the whole idea was by putting everything together, you can actually plan out how you get across your bridge. You can use that synonym many times. 
So what are you going to discover today? Well, I'm going to talk about the myths behind the grants. I'm going to talk about the three different flavors of grant, except COVID. I'm going to mention a COVID grant in a minute, but I don't usually cover that. I'm then going to talk a bit about the funded support available, and there is a lot of fully funded support available. And then I'm going to talk about how to put it all together so you don't end up with a half-built bridge. You get a completed bridge at the minimum cost, minimum time, and maximum support for you. Does that sound good? I hope that sounds good. So, as I said, we don't usually cover COVID grants, uh, but I did want, want to mention this one. This is an advanced restrictions grant uh, being offered by Birmingham City Council at the moment. And that's grant funding between £5,000 and £50,000 towards projects which will drive your business recovery and safeguard existing jobs. All you have to do for this, have a look. It's, it's an application form there. If you've been trading for more than three months, you can apply. And if you're implementing a recovery plan in a maximum of three months, you can apply for that. So please have a look at that. I don't usually do COVID grants because there's lots of people who kind of cover them and they kind of come and go quite quickly. What I'd say with that one is it does say first come first served and these things do disappear quickly. So if it's something you're interested in having a look at, please do that sooner rather than later. So what are the myths and the facts behind, behind grants? Well, let's have a look at this. There is grants are for nothing or there's grants for everything. This seems to be the thing I get is people seem to be convinced they can never get a grant for anything because the grants aren't really out there for them. Well, that isn't true. But then you get people who've got a couple of grants who think there should be grants for everything. Like I have had phone calls from people saying, um, can I please get a grant to actually... Um, you know, plug this gap in my warehouse roof. I've got a leak in my roof. Can I get a grant for that? And the answer is no. And sometimes you get people saying, I'd like to go to this um, event somewhere and I can't get a grant for that. As I say to people, there isn't a grant for everything. There are grants for some things and it's worth having a look to see if whatever you're doing, if there is a grant available for it, but don't expect there to be always be a grant. The thing is though, is if you don't know the third, people don't go looking for them. So I'm gonna tell you about some of them today. I'm gonna to tell you about funded support and tell you how you can kind of find these things. So one thing I often run into is this idea of the grant versus funding confusion. That's basically, somebody sent me um, a, a, it was a newspaper article. And it basically said there's a company that had got 25 million pound in funding for PPE, this was in the middle of last year. And they said, this is incredible, can't we get a grant for 25 million quid to do this? Da, 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 da. And what they hadn't done was they hadn't read the article properly. Um, they, they actually got grants of about, I think 125,000 pounds and the rest of it was a debt from the bank. So often funding is often confused with grants. They're not the same thing. Grant is part of funding, but funding can, can include debt and it can include uh, equity so there are other types of funding as well so sometimes if you get the idea that there's massive grants out there there are some big grants out there true but if you read that start thinking when i read funding is that a mix of grant and debt and it probably is so many businesses think i'm too new i'm too small or i'm too big to get a grant that isn't true there are grants for everybody you know even if you set up yesterday you can pro there are grants you can get um and even if you're one man band there's grants you can get and again that too big is often people kind of think well i've got 100 staff i'm not a small and medium-sized enterprise yes you can. yes you still are so I, I was asked to cover this in detail and this might be a bit dull but i was asked to cover it in detail because a lot of people who get very close to the edge of what an sme actually is and the thing is as soon as you're bigger than an sme a lot of the grants disappear there's a lot of help you can't get as an SME, there's a lot of support. Once you get above that, there's a lot less. So it's a good idea to know what this is. So it's basically, it's an enterprise with a headcount of less than 250 people. Now that headcount is a hard number, that is. And then it's either an annual turnover of less than 50 million euros or an annual balance sheet total less than 43 million euros. So I'm, that's probably most of the people on the call here, I suspect fit into that. But it's good to know. So, so with that finance, it could be one or the other. The headcount is the hard barrier. Now, you only lose your SME status when you go above the headcount or financial ceiling for two consecutive accounting periods. So it isn't like if you suddenly go to 252 employees and then the next year you back down to 248, you, just, you wouldn't lose your SME status. So it's good to know because the whole idea of this it isn't to stop you growing. Is it stuff we go, oh my God, we, we just crossed that barrier. So you don't lose it for two accounting periods. 
and calculating your headcount. This is important as well, because some people say to me, well, I've got, you know, 260, but there's a mix of people. Because the thing is, is full-time workers count as one unit, but part-time staff, seasonal workers, and those who do not work the full year are treated as fractions of one unit. So you might have 270 staff, but if 40 of them are working part-time half, half, half the week, you'd actually still be under, probably you'd be at your 250, you'd have to have somebody a bit more just to creep under that. But it's worth knowing. Also excluded from headcount, apprenticeships and vocational training contracts, they don't count. And employees on maternity or parental leave don't count either. So when you're looking at headcount, if you're just over the 250, it's worth having a look, breaking it down. You may well still be an SME. Now, as I said, it's not the most interesting subject, but it is an important one to me. So here's the thing I get is I said earlier, people like to think grants kind of cover everything and they don't. So some things grants definitely don't cover. They don't generally cover your startup costs. There's like one and a half exceptions to that, but generally most grants won't cover you for kind of getting your business going, setting up a website, doing all of these other things. They don't cover maintenance work, like uh, patching up your warehouse, your office, something like that. They don't cover general business expenses. They won't cover some types of marketing. They won't cover, for example, pay-per-click, Facebook advertising, things like that. They won't cover usual professional fees like your accountant or your solicitor, and they don't cover pay or wages. There's one exception to that, which I will mention, but most of them don't cover that. The vast majority, as we'll see, and I'll mention this again and again, is most grants are match funded and for external spend. So, uh, but there is one big exception which I'll touch on. So what can grants cover that? Well, they can be used to help you develop new products, new services, including digital. They can be used for market development. They can be used for capital expenditure, so buying new equipment, new machinery, that type of thing. Can be used for office relocation, refurbishment. Can be used for quality improvement, process improvement, coaching and consultancy, and training. So there's lots and lots of things that grants can be used for. So it's good to know, okay, these are the things that I could probably get a grant for. The other things you, you, you're not gonna get a grant for. So one thing you'd kind of need to know with grants is, and I always love this, is if you've got something that's reasonably confusing, uh, like grants can be, um, you should always get some Latin in there because that always makes it a lot, lot more easy to understand. If you add in some Latin, yep, that makes it a lot, not simpler. So the other thing in, uh, this is an EU funding and they call it de minimis. And de minimis is Latin just means it's so small, it doesn't really make a difference. It's kind of the translation, it's, it's too small to make a difference. So you can receive up to 200,000 euros, which is about 180,000 pound over three years. So if you had a grant, say for the exact amount of 180,000 pounds, three years and one day ago, you'd actually be able to get another 180 grand today. So I, I, as time goes by, the grants you've had, the funding support you've had kind of drops off your kind of support list. So it's always worth having a look at that. I know very few companies who've actually got to that level. There aren't that many. And if you're there, it's worth looking back saying, well, when did we have our first grant? Is that now full enough? And there is another thing called general block exemption regulations. Now that covers certain things like research and development. And they are exempt. They set separately to this de minimis. And as we'll see, often under that, uh, the, the different conditions are not quite as favourable as if they're done under de minimis. So what are the three different flavours of grants? What are the three different flavours you get out there? Well, there are three kind of ones. I, I, I always like to use this analogy. There are small grants. Um, that, that's our first flavour, and they're usually for growth, and they usually like vary from about five hundred pound up to about twelve thousand pound. So they, they can go up to a substantial amount, but they're usually for doing something um, growth and innovation. Now, I do need to mention this here because this is another confusing thing about grants: is the word innovation. So innovation here in this small grants means doing something new in your business. It isn't something new in the world. It's not something that hasn't been done before. It's something that is new to your business. So for example, if you've never sold online before and you set up an online shop, that is innovation. If you've put together a new website, which has got some new functionality, which I haven't had before, that's innovation. If you brought in some digitalization, that's innovation in your business. The thing is, when we move on to like the R&D, that Innovate UK grants, you see that when, it, when they use the word innovation, they do mean new in the world new in the world. So that's that's the sometimes confusing over 
what what do you mean by innovation? So with these small grants, it's new to you. It's only with the massive R&D like Innovate UK grants, it becomes new in world. So you get those small grants, then you get what I call job creation grants, and they can be 10 grand up to a million pound. And as the name suggests, they involve you creating some jobs from it. And then finally get those proper R&D Innovate UK grants, which is where you're gonna do something new in the world, gonna really grow your business, do something kind of quite amazing. And I'm gonna just touch on them. There's a lot to kind of cover in all of these, and I'm just gonna give you like a whistle stop tour on it. So let's have a look at small grants. Small grants offered by councils, universities, LEPs and others, that are always external spend only, and they're always matched from the, a specific project, and they differ by your local enterprise partnership. Um, now, obviously, um, we've already kind of touched on this, but there's often one thing when I speak to people, some people aren't kind of sure what a LEP is. So a local enterprise partnership are the people who look after, you know, where, where money goes, where funding goes, and they do a fantastic job. And you've got the Greater Birmingham Solly one. I've again put that map, though you've seen that earlier. The reason why I've always included that map is it's a little less obvious what area that covers than say the Black Country, Coventry and Warwickshire, because they're a lot cleaner. You need to know where is it, do you pay your rates and what's your postcode? Because that will tell you what funding you can get and what funding you can't. Because all of these projects, all the funds I'm gonna mention, they're always tied to a LEP. And if you're in that area, you can access them. And if you're not, you can't. If you're wondering out that list where the marches is, you won't find that on a map, that's Shropshire and Herefordshire. Uh, but then you, you get those six of the laps of the West Midlands laps. So if you know where you are, you'll know what is available to you. I'm presuming every today is from the Great Birmingham Solihull lap, um, but I, I'm doing that just in case we've got people from Black Country or Coventry and Warwickshire. So let's have a look at some of these small grants. Um, There's a very nice one. This is for the GBS lab and Coventry and Warwickshire. And this is called the Proof of Concept Grant. This is offered by Coventry University. You get 40% match funding on projects of up to 25 grand. The maximum grant you can receive based on my maths is 10,000 pounds. And the average people get is about 4K. That can be used for intellectual property, can be used for market research, prototype development and other feasibility concepts. Um, if these grants are mentioned, these small grants, they're fairly easy to get. Um, and the team will help you apply for them. And what I say to people is it's worth knocking on these doors, finding out what's available and then taking it, taking it from there. Cause they are, they're not huge grants, but they are worth having. Next one is the Innovation Networks. That's again run by Coventry University. And that gives you 44% match funding on projects between 5,000 pounds and 22,000 pounds. And that can be used for materials, prototypes, marketing, app development, testing, lots of things that can be used for really popular project this one with our members. Um, and that's Coventry and Warwickshire, Black Country and GBS lab. It covers all of that. And then the final one I'm going to touch on here is Focus Digital. And that again is Coventry University. And if you're looking to grow using digital technology, there are small grants from 1,000 to 6,000 pounds. Uh, well, it, it cover 40% of that one to 6,000 pound project. Um, but alternatively, if, if, you, if you're not looking for the money there, you can get lots of workshops, webinars on one-to-one -one digital support. So there's a lot of support though. So if you decide not to go for the money to pay somebody else to do the work for you, then it's, you can work with, with, with the team itself will help you deliver whatever it is. So there's a couple of grants to get you going. There are others. Um, again, what I'll do at the end is please look to kind of line up a free discovery call with me. I'll mention it and I'll show the thing. And I will go through you where you are, where you want to get to, and I can point you towards everything that's exactly right for you today. I just want to give you a flavor. So job creation grants, that's the business growth program too. That's probably very, very well known. That's 50% match from the grants of from 10 grand up to a million pound. You must create a new job for every 10,000 pound grant within six months and your business must be over six months old. Now that project is coming towards an end and it's worth seeing um, whether there's still funding available for that. Um, but if you have a look online, check it out, uh, Google that, uh, see where they are. It, it, it's, it's very, very good program, very popular program. Because there's lots of things you can spend that money on. Capital expenditure, market development, building information modeling, new product development, relocation expansion. There's lots of things that are really, that's really, really good grant that one. Have a look. That one is a bit more complex to apply for. You might need some support with that. That's a bit longer than the small grants. But if you're looking to spend a good chunk of money and you're going to be employing three, four, five or six people in the next six months, then that's something to worth have a look at. 
Um, so basically what I've, I've just included here, for example, this just gives an example of um, under de minimis, you get 50%. If you wanted more than that 180,000 pound grant, you can, because you kind of think, how do you get a million pound grant? At that point, you'd only get a smaller percentage. So if you're doing capital expenditure and you're in a non-assisted area, you get 20% if you're a small business or 10% if you're a medium-sized business. Again, all the information is there. It's worth having a look at. In most cases, unless you're going to be spending, I, I think I worked out, unless you're spending over 600 grand, it's not worth going under the general block exemption regulations, unless you've already used your de minimis. But it's always worth knowing these things. So I want to touch on Innovate UK grants uh, very quickly. So these grants vary from £10,000 to £5 million and they can be for R&D and other costs. They can offer up to 100% of the cost. Most of them offer 70%, most. There's a couple and they're called the small uh, SBRI, the Small Business Research Initiative Grants. And they're usually smaller and they're for something specific and they will cover all of your costs. Your cost there as well, this is the grant where it can cover wages. This is where you can cover things internally. They are very competitive, very competitive. And there are regular competitions. So it's worth having a look. I'll show the website in a minute. It's worth having a look there, see what's available. There is one called the Smart Grant. Now that's open to pretty much anybody. That is massively competitive. What I would say is if you can find a competition that's more specifically about what you do, that's much better to apply for that one than the Smart one. Um, I know in the July, I think the Smart Grant, they had, um, it was something like 2,500 applications for what was basically 100 grants so it gives you an idea that one's really competitive other ones much easier um they are time intensive what i mean by that is if you're looking to fill one of these things in it's about a week solid work they're, they're, they're not the easiest thing to fill in i would highly recommend that you work with somebody we work with um one of our guys is tbat innovation uh, one of our sponsors and, and they help our our people kind of for letting our members kind of complete this thing because it is worth getting some support. They also have that initial conversation of what is your chances of winning it? Based on your idea and your where, where your business is, what chance do you have of winning it? Because some there's no point in trying to do it and spend a lot of time and money unless you've got a realistic chance of actually winning. So competitions, as I said, some very specific ones, look for them. Um, try to avoid the Innovate UK Smart Grants because they are really competitive. And I've put the link there, um, apply for innovation, funding service, uh, gov.uk backslash competition search. Go to that, that will list all the competitions. There's usually about 20 on the go. Usually about 20 anyway, at a given time. Uh, before I started into this, I wish I'd know, suit for companies with PAYE. Um, if you don't have PAYE, you can only charge £22 an hour. You can subcontract work. Universities can partner up to 30% and their costs are fully covered. Worth getting a university involved. They can include 20% labor costs for overheads like admin. So in other words, you can only pay people doing the R&D stuff, but you can add in some of your own costs, 20% uh, of up to that. And you can include other costs as well, like travel, uh, substance, stuff like that. So uh, some hints and tips. They look to disqualify for any reasons to make sure it's right. Answer all the questions when the question be systematic. Collaborate with the business and work with the university and win something significant before going big. So I'm going to very quickly cover fully funded support. There was loads of that from the university that helped you be more efficient, more competitive, more profitable. I really recommend you look at this because all of the grants, as I said, they're always match funded. You're always paying somebody else to do stuff and you have to match fund it. If you can get the university for free, that's a, that's a better way of proceeding. So there's two flavors of support with this. There's 12 hours of support. That's usually workshops, research, and this investigation. If that works out well, then you get eight to 12 days of support to develop your idea or whatever it is further. Two, I really want to mention very quickly, this is a great course from by Aston Business School, increase your sales, prices, and retention. Really good stuff. Manufacturing engineering tech and now services business as well. Help you sell more, increase the price of products, tie customers into long-term contracts and grow within the current sector. Companies who've done that have more than doubled their turnover. One went from 2 million to 5 million. Definitely worth a look at. Excellent course. Another project I'm going to mention, which is uh, 
a support one where they'll help you as the enabling technologies project. Again, that's at Aston University, and they can help you to innovate by adopting new technologies, including artificial intelligence, virtual reality, 5G and big data. Really good project as well. Again, if you kind of contact me with a discovery call, I will give you lots and lots more of these things. Um, it's also worth having a look at the MTC, they, uh, the Manufacturing Technology Centre. They do some really good support as well. And the final thing I want to mention is have a look at this website, confer.online. That will help you find support from all over the UK. You can put in whatever you're interested in and it'll come back with something. All I would say with that is you do need time. You need about an hour. There's, there's way too much information on there. You're going to have to wade through things, but it's worth having a look at if you're looking for support. So finally, how do you put it all together? Well, this is what I help companies with on a discovery call. Look at what your goal is, where do you want to get to? You're building a bridge, go from here to here. Break that down into stages. First off, you map on your fully funded projects. Okay, so say you've got five chunks, two of them could be fully funded. Then you map on your grants, you might find two of the chunks you get match funded for, which leaves you only one chunk to pay for. So that is the best way to get your bridge across and minimize your costs, maximize your benefit. There is a thing there called the knowledge transfer program. If you require longer support, where it's two or three years, that's definitely worth having a look at. Again, book a discovery call for me and I'll explain that more to you. So you now know the myths, the three different types of grants, fully funded support, and how to put it all together. So as I said earlier, the problem is there's lots of help out there and it's just not very well known about. I can't cover all of it in this, and a lot of it you kind of go, that isn't for me anyway, that isn't for me anyway. So this is why we came up with the solution, the technology supply chain, where we just link you all together. And that's the, the thing I do with most of our members, we'll have a half hour call, they will tell me where they are, where they want to get to, what type of business they are, and I will just give them about eight, 10, 12 introductions to fully funded support and the grants that are right for them. And I, you know, I introduce them directly and that works very, very well. That will help ensure you don't have any half built bridges. We are a community, uh, we're a group. We did the innovation awards uh, this year, which went very well. We like getting people together. We get people together on a monthly basis and we're very supportive of each other. We are always looking to provide that stepping stone approach that I've just outlined there, of how you get across the bridge so you can get there in a controlled step-by-step -step way. And we're always looking for West Midlands companies in manufacturing, technology and professional services. As I said, we don't cost you anything at all. Um, and we can help you to cut costs, increase efficiencies, develop new product services, discover new markets and clients and find new suppliers. What's not to like? Uh, hopefully that, that, that might be of interest to you. How do we do that? Well, we help you to find the grants. We help you to access funding support. We help you discover free workshops. We uncover new opportunities and we make those connections for you through discovery calls. So that's how we do it all. Some key points that I just want to kind of highlight here as they often come up as questions. We help with grants, but we are not bid writers. Um, so we, we will direct you towards the stuff, but we don't write Innovate UK grants. We don't do that type of thing. Um, technology supply chain does not take a commission from the grants or fully funded support you receive. That's a big thing people seem to, to, to kind of worry about is, are we going to get a chunk of that? No, we don't take a slice of your grant or your fully funded support. How we fund ourselves is we're funded through universities, generous patrons and grants. So that's basically how we cover our costs is that way. It's not through that commission. So if you'd like uh, to take your next step, I'm going to actually share um, this link in the chat now. Um, if you if you click on that link, you can actually you'll go into my little diary thing and you'll be able to book a 30 minute session with me and I can take you through all the grants and fully from the support, which is right for you. As I said, there is a lot, lot more than what I've been able to touch on today. Um, I just need I just wanted to give you a flavor of what is available and what is out there and show you um, by thinking of three different flavors of grants, what you should be having a look at and how and how you might move, move forward. So three reasons you might want to take up that discovery call and you might want to get involved is number one, we help move your business forward using the grants and funded support available. Uh, two, we are completely free of charge, don't cost you anything. And uh, we are a community interest company. So we're not a charity, but as we're close to charities you can get, we're not for profit. And um, we, we, we're very keen to help local businesses. Not only do all the grants and fully funded support, we've also got our own graduate kickstart program as well. We help people through that. Uh, so please book a discovery uh, meeting with me. Um, you can find my availability on that link there. And I think that's pretty much, oh, I've got 27 seconds to spare according to my uh, thing, but I, I hope you found that useful. 
and I will hand back. Thank you very much. Thank you ever, ever so much for that, Richard. That was fascinating and uh, and did exactly what was on the tin, really. You know, we were looking for that that really clear uh, explanation of what's actually out there. And I think the, the takeaway from it is that there's lots out there. And again, it, you know, it's, it can be dependent upon whereabouts you are in the world, uh, size of your business, stage of your business. And, you know, um, we're, we're very conscious of that and what we try to do, again, through, through the growth hub side of things is be that initial point of contact and working with delivery partners like Richard and with Adrian to make sure that at the end of the day, the business gets the support it actually needs. So um, we've had quite a number of, of questions come in, which is great. So what I'd like to do is just have a quick run through some of those. If we don't get them all um, uh, answered today, then again, what we will do is make sure that we can feed those back to you. Um, so, so the first one that came in really uh, related to is there any specific advice for the self-employed rather than limited businesses in terms of raising finance? Yeah, I suppose I'll kick off with that one. It's, there, there are funders out there that would only look to fund or lend to limited companies. Uh, I think what you've got to look at with, with self-employed is the, the interconnection between you know, the personal income and expenditure and their business income and expenditure. And it, it comes back to the basics that uh, you've got to be able to produce your cash flow forecast. And the, one of the, the, the most important things about your cash flow forecast are the assumptions behind it. Uh, anyone can walk into a funder and say, I'm going to turn over a million pounds next year or indeed a hundred thousand pounds. But what's a breakdown of that sort of, you know, each module you're going to sell or each bit of equipment or indeed machinery or product that you're looking to sell or indeed a service that you're looking to sell. It's being able to actually, uh, you know, in the old days, uh, self-employed status was, was seen as being good because you had full recourse to assets. So therefore, you know, if you were going to call up a debt, then you, know, you had the, the personal liability of, of the obligation. Whereas limited companies, limited liability partnerships came in, then you are sometimes more often than not limited by personal guarantee. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of funders out there that will still look at self-employed status. Uh, most of them are looking at cash flow projections. As I say, most of them are looking to validate those cash flow projections based on the assumptions that are behind there. But we certainly do have a lot of funders that will look at, uh, you know, sole traders. Okay. Um, thank you, Adrian. Did, did you want to come in there, Richard, at all? Or? All I'd say there, John, is for the fully funded support and those smaller grants, it doesn't matter if you're self-employed or your company. Um, if you've got a unique tax reference, um, that, that's absolutely fine. Um, I, I suspect if you're going for an Innovate UK grant, you'd want to be a, a company if you're looking for that type of thing. But generally for those smaller grants, £500 to 12 grand, they're very happy to work with self-employed people. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, this, this may be, uh, uh, again, for both of you really, but the question related to <coughs> um, uh, any seed funding or, or grants for startups? So I'll, I'll kick off. It's, it's not a grant, but we work with uh, you know British Business Bank in relation to startup loans. Uh, so startup loans are a company that will provide uh, up to twenty five thousand pounds per director in the company. So if you've got four directors, it's up to one hundred thousand pounds of investment in your business. It is a personal loan, so it's you personally that is borrowing that money. Therefore, you will then invest in your company either through director's loans or share capital, however you choose to do that tax efficiently from that side of it. Uh, we have a sp specific people in the team that work exclusively with startup loans and therefore can reference somebody who is looking to start up and looking for that. Again, you'll need a business plan and you'll need a cash flow projection, but startup loans and ourselves will help you build that business plan and help you build that cash flow projection. Thank you, Adrian. Um, I, I, I would add to that, John, there, are, there aren't any specific startup grants. All of the grants are covered, you could get as a startup, but please remember there are always external spend and what you're looking to do elsewhere. So there isn't, I do often get a call saying, I'm starting up and I need to pay myself. Um, is there a grant? And unfortunately there isn't for that. There is for the innovation. So if you were start, even if you started up last week, some of those grants I mentioned that you could apply for, but as I said, 
they're always external spend and always match funded. And, and one thing I do know from um, from working with these guys is, is, is they say sometimes you've had to trace it back because somebody said, I want to do this work with this company here. And it turns out they have the same director as their company. So they do check these things as well. So it's kind of like you, you it'd have to go to somebody else. And in some cases, that's really useful. If you're looking to do a marketing thing and you get a marketing grant that can match fund, brilliant. But unfortunately, there isn't one for kind of paying yourself and things like that. Oh, uh, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned uh, match funding there, Richard, because we've, we've had a question around uh, around grants that was talking about uh, quite often that they are match funded, um, and what we what the question was really is is where could we get the match from? We don't have that kind of finance. Uh, usually, that's probably where you'd have a chat with Adrian. So you, you, you want to have a look at loans you can get, various other things as well. Because it, it, it's usually the government uh, of these parts of the, you put some of your money in, they'll put some money in as well, but you've always got to look at where you're going to get that. And the reason you've got actually got to get the full amount, um, because what will happen with them is you pay and then you get refunded your part of the grant. So say it was £20,000 project, you'd have to pay your 20 grand and then you'd reclaim your 10, 10 grand back. Um, so you've got to have you're going to have to set up some type of uh, debit facility to do that. But, but I know there's plenty of people out there who, who can lend you on that on the basis that obviously you're going to get that back. Yeah, and I think when you, you're looking at match funding, you've got somebody else doing the due diligence as well. So they're looking at the purpose you want to borrow, the money, the investment you're going to put. <coughs> excuse me, the investment you're going to put. <coughs> excuse me. The investment you're going to put into your business therefore you know if you're going to a funder and you've got a grant head to terms in relation to a grant that is refundable once you've invested that money it does give a funder a wee bit more confidence because they've looked at the business plan they've looked at the cash flow forecast they've looked at the, the purpose and the reason why that money's being invested uh, thanks adrian and uh, one of the things that we quite often come across within uh, within the growth of is uh, is as where a business is looking to apply for a grant retrospectively. And what I mean by that is that they, they've actually already invested, but then become aware of a particular grant that could have uh, provided some support towards that. And of course, we can't do that. And, and what, we, what we strive to do is, is to try to get those messages out that, you, you know, please don't, uh, please don't invest in something without exploring any of the opportunities that might be out there. And that could be anything from uh, R&D, you know, through, through to training or wherever that might be, because there's nothing worse than finding out that you would have been eligible for something, you know. So again, a, a key message there really is, is that, you know, please get in touch because it may be something that we can help. Okay, um, now uh, I'm not sure who this one is probably, it's probably going to be better for, for Adrian and uh, apologies if I put you on the spot here, Adrian, but um, it says, can FinPoint work with a company based in Kenya? Not put me on the spot, but it's a, an absolute valid question. I think uh, my experience would tell me that it would be difficult to find a fun, funder from you know, supporting a business in Kenya. Uh, we're normally looking at uh, businesses that are UK domiciled and the principles of the business are UK domiciled. Uh, there are some funders that, believe it or not, won't lend in Scotland. And there's some funders that won't lend in Northern Ireland for, you know, the different legalities of the purpose of uh, and the security over that kind of it. So I'd probably need to have a chat offline with the person that's asking the question and see if I can give them any pointers. Uh, but, you know... At the moment, I'd say it would be difficult to find a funder that would support a business in Kenya. Okay, uh, thank you, Adrian. Uh, and on that kind of internationalisation front, uh, a question, could you explain a little bit more about the internationalisation grants and how we can apply for those? Um, what, what do they mean by internationalisation? If somebody would like to come off uh, mute and just explain. Yeah, um, where did that come from? Um, oh, it's anonymous attendee. So some, somebody's asked the question, can you explain more about internationalization grants and how to apply? I don't know if that individual would like to mute themselves. Okay, um, 
don't worry. Uh, that that's something that again, when we send out the uh, form, and I've put a link in in the chat already. Uh, if that person would just like to elaborate on that, then again, that's something that we can come back to you on. Um, so there's there's a question now about the EU. So looking at trading from the EU to EU, uh, and it was about advice on getting uh, Southern Ireland, so Republic of Ireland VAT number. Pass for me, unfortunately. Yeah. Great. Okay. <laughs> that's that's one for us to pick up then. So we will. Yeah make sure that we come back to, to you on that one. And in fact, it's worth mentioning that we have a specific programme which is all about uh, support in, in terms of trading with the EU or trading with Europe now. So we can uh, we can on to one sessions with, uh, with a whole raft of different subject matter experts on that. And indeed, uh, you may recall that I plugged an event that's coming up, which is all about, again, trading with the EU, and that would be a great way of asking that particular question really sorry john before you move on we've got mark burkett who's got his hand raised mark you got a question hi, or hi yes sorry hi uh, john um just a, a point there about the internationalization fund um first of all just to explain i'm the exports academy advisor from birmingham um, and solihull coventry and warwickshire um what the clients online who asked the question about that the internationalization fund is a fund which primarily isn't available to um, SMEs. There's a criteria for it, which is £500,000 um, turnover. So not many SMEs would fall into that bracket, but also um, it's match funded. So they'll offer up to 50% um, of the funding up to a maximum of £9,000. So um, the client would have to put £9,000 in and they'd match that with £9,000 of the internationalization fund but as i say it's the criteria that falls down um, for smes so it's not really something that smes um, can apply for um, and be successful we have had applications where the turnover has been around about four hundred thousand k um, and if there's a supporting argument from the ica um that we have had success on that but as i say it's the few and far between really uh, right. Well, well, thank you, Mark, for for explaining right. that. And uh, yeah, that's that's been that's been very informative. So thank you for that. Um, the next one um, related to um, it was a question really about minority SMEs and uh, what are the common barriers to why they are declined from funding uh, from the high street bands, uh, banks. So I'm not sure I understand the question. Minority SMEs. Yeah. So uh, what are the common barriers to why uh, they are often declined for debt funding? Um, and, and that through the uh, high street banks is the question. Okay. So the, the, the most common reason for the clinicure of an application is in relation to debt serviceability and uh, the ability to actually prove to the funder that you can actually service the commitment you're looking to take on. Uh, and then that's either by the business plan not uh, articulating itself correctly and how they're going to develop, or indeed if it's new start, move into profitability, what the target audience is, and, and sometimes actually down to the, you know, the, the cash flow projections not principally being understood by the, the business owner. Uh, they've gone to an accountant or they've gone to a business advisor and they have prepared the cash flow projections. But, you know, what every cash flow projection, you should do two of them. In principle, you should do one, you know, well, in fact, three, probably. Best case scenario, 100% of revenue turnover, then 70%, and then absolutely crucial to do what's called a, what I call a break-even cash flow. So if you know exactly what you need to turn over, you truly understand what your overheads are, therefore your cost of delivering that service, you can then articulate how many items you need to sell or indeed hours you need to sell to actually deliver that. Uh, so debt serviceability is uh, the most, the, the biggest reason because funders, all funders, lend on the ability to repay. The second part of it, so first exit is can you repay me? Second exit is security personal guarantee and or heritable security. 
Uh, so the first thing I'm going to look at is, you know, your cash flow projections. I'm going to look at your detailed assumptions behind that. And I'm going to be engaged with a funder to try and make sure we articulate that in a positive manner. Thanks, Adrian. Um, so uh, final question that we've got uh, at the moment relates to, um, I have a business in Africa and we're looking uh, for investors for our company. Um, now, it, the company's based in Tanzania, so uh, I think the question relates to how can how come they attract for that particular business that is based in Tanzania? Again, not my area of expertise, but in relation to any sort of information memorandum that you're going to pull together, you need to be able to articulate to your investor what they're going to get in return. What's the payback? Because anybody who invests in any business be it equity investment, they're looking at a three or five year payback period for, for that investment to be there. So it's to make sure that your information memorandum, you know, clearly articulates the true purpose of the business, the, the profitability, the projected trajectory of that business, you know, if it is start up into, you know, profitable and growth. Uh, equity, uh, Tanzania is not going to qualify for EIS, so not the Enterprise Investment Scheme, therefore tax deductible in the UK. So it's again, it's making sure that you've done your homework in relation to what you're presenting in front of an investor to convince the investor that there, there is a return on their investment. Okay, thank you, Adrian. Um, uh, unless we have any uh, more questions, what I'd like to do then is just... Um, just return to the uh, presentation. And um, it's about where we go from here, really. So as I mentioned at the very start of this, um, what we were keen to do was not only raise awareness around business finance and grants and so on, but we also wanted to provide a mechanism um, for you to gain that uh, continued support really through this. So um, there's a few ways in which you can do that. So we we put together uh, a support request stroke feedback form. We're obviously very keen to get your feedback from today's event. Uh, we're particularly looking to see how we can develop more of these that would uh, provide value. And uh, so if you click on that link, that will, uh, it's a very short form, I do promise you, but it will capture both any requests that you've got for support, but also what it will do is it will uh, allow us to get a little bit of uh, feedback from yourselves about today, what you found valuable, the kind of things that you would like to see going forward as well. So as I mentioned, when you click on that link, it's a very short form. Once we've got the details from you, one of the team will be able to get in touch with you. And we've tried to break that down into a number of different areas because we talked about the business advisor role. Um, again, uh, very uh, the approach that we take about that is is speaking with you on a one-to-one -one basis to understand what's the best kind of support that you could gain from this from us at this at this time, um, and that will take the format of uh, usually a telephone call or a Teams call or a Zoom call as we're on today, so that you can have that impartial conversation with one of our advisors. I've included the skills of advisors in there as well because they may be opportunities for you are there again to tap into some of the support that's out there to develop or recruit within your organizations. And then there's, a, there's another one, which is about anybody that's looking to specifically invest at the moment and are looking for the best way forward on that. And again, that's something that we can pick up with our finance specialists, with Richard, with Adrian, to again, make sure that you get the right kind of support on that really. Um, alternatively, if you want to give us a call, that's the main, uh, telephone number, website, and the email address for us on there, really. So um, uh, in closing, really, just to, just to re-emphasize again that we will be sending out a copy of, uh, of all the presentations for, for today, and um, uh, that link will be on there as well. So I hope you found it valuable. Um, we've, we've certainly... Um, uh, been very, very excited about the number of businesses that have booked onto this. So it's been clear, a clear demonstration that there has been a lot of confusion out there. We've, hopefully we've, we've taken some of that away. So thank you again for your time for today. Um, please do get in touch and hopefully we'll be able to see you again in the very near future. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.